So in keeping with the ongoing emergency order from Governor Charlie Baker to limit gatherings and maximize social distancing and under legislation passed to address remote board meetings during the emergency declaration, this meeting will be conducted over Zoom. Attendance by board members will be remote and remote attendance shall count toward quorum. The meeting will be broadcast live and recorded on ECAP. To join a remote meeting using your computer, click on the URL at the top of the meeting agenda or copy and paste it into your browser. To join a remote meeting using your phone, call the number provided underneath the URL. You'll be needing the meeting ID to join by phone only. So the first item on the agenda is to um, approve the minutes from December 14th. We have a motion to approve the minutes from December 14th. Are you muted, Aria? Sure was, seconded. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Oh, uh, Zayas, yes. Mills, yes. LeBlanc, yes. Okay, so we can skip the variances because is there anything under that? I don't think so. Is he answering, Kristen? Yeah, they're trying to log in. I think they may have oh, had the cool. same issue. I think what may have happened is you were emailed the URL for the original posting and then the um, agenda was revised and I think there was a, a new um, credential that was sent. Um, so he's trying. Okay. So if you want, we can go ahead to, um, I had the, I had Nicole put the COVID update on this uh, meeting agenda because we did not meet um, for that in-between meeting that focused in on COVID. And of course it is vitally important that um, everybody get an update. Um, although all you have to do is turn the news on and I can attest to the fact we are in a surge. Um, cases are skyrocketing. We are experiencing heavy, heavy amounts of flow, heavy amounts of positive. It's exactly what the news is saying. We're seeing it go through households. We're seeing it, um, and it's taking time as it goes through households, which is making for some very extended um, isolation and quarantines because people that are in quarantine are having to restart isolation once they test positive. And once that so if they had the positive down in the basement, once another person in the house tests positive, everybody else has to restart their quarantine. So it's pretty complicated um, dealing with a lot of these. Um, let me just let Mark in and let Tim in. And there we go. Okay. Um, so last week when um, the state dashboard came out, it listed that Easton had um, 200 cases in the two week period. The two week period that we're talking about at that point was um, December 21st, I believe, through um, January 2nd, um, 200 cases. And then if you look at the report, it actually has another column over on the right-hand side that says total cases, and it listed out 221. The difference between those two numbers is the 200 are the PCR positives that we're getting. The 21 is the antigen positives that we're getting. If I ran that same report, and we've talked about how in the past that those numbers go up and down and fluctuate depending on when they do the data grab and that they're influenced by how quickly the lab is putting up some of these test results. If I ran that same date range today, it would go to 210 confirmed PCRs plus an additional 31. So we would have actually been at 241, 20 cases more than what was shown in last week's report. Before we met tonight, I ran what will be the next report. Um, and they won't pull that data down until this coming Wednesday. But if I pull that data right now, and that's for December 27th through, incorporates December 27th through January 9th, last Saturday. And a lot of the cases we know it takes two or three days. So a lot of the positive results aren't even in there yet. Right now, there are 248 PCR positives plus 31 antigen positives for that two week period. And we still have two more days 
that the labs can upload the results that they have. Um, so as you can see, that the numbers are going up. They will continue to go up as, as I said, as we go through this end part where the passing of the virus is happening in the houses um, and people have to start extending their, the time that they're in their homes. Um, sorry, my phone's making some noises. Um, this kind of acts as a natural segue to go into some um, new information and some exciting information that um, I wanted to share with you. And has already been shared in the form of a press release that went out just before this meeting. And that is that um, we know still that getting tested, especially for asymptomatic people, um, is sometimes a frustrating undertaking, being not knowing where to go, not knowing um, where you're going to get your results or how soon you can get your results. Um, so we are utilizing that need as an opportunity to test some of our emergency preparedness ca capacity for um, things that may come in the future. And the town will be doing a pop-up testing site this coming Saturday. Um, the link just went live on the um, town, through the press release and on the town website for people to register. Um, it will be a drive-through uh, sampling clinic um, down at the Bay Road Fire Station. People do need to pre-register and people do need to be over 18, 18 and over and residents of the town of Easton. Um, insurance information will be collected. We hope to be able to um, recover some of the expense of conducting this um, through insurance, but nobody will be billed and people should not stay away if they don't have insurance. It's just an extra bonus um, if we're able to recover anything as part of this. Um, with that also comes um, the, as a lot of you have seen, um, the different stages that are being rolled out for actual vaccine distribution. This actually gives us kind of an opportunity in a very controlled way to test how a drive-through clinic, in this case testing, potentially in the future um, vaccination, um, would operate and how we would staff it and allows us the opportunity to identify and work out any bugs before things um, are really important as far as distributing vaccine. Um, the town is going to be over the weekend and into next week rolling out and administering our first doses to our first responders. They are the next tier in the um, phased chart that the governor and his commission have released for vaccine distribution. Um, the encouraging thing to me is as I look at that chart and I see they are, they are systematically moving through the different pieces. Um, it is kind of a learn as you go. Um, we're not getting a lot of advanced information from the state. Um, and to that point, the next group under our first response responders, we have not been given any guidance yet as to how those doses will be delivered and by whom they will be delivered by. As we've seen in the different tiers that have rolled out previous to this, kind of the announcement has come out with then the plan, um, whether it was within the hospitals, I think we all knew because they were getting the first batches of the Pfizer vaccine, that it was going to um, happen for healthcare workers in the hospital center centers that were forward facing actually at work. The next group being the people that are in long-term care facilities, the state rolled out a partnership with CVS and Walgreens and, and that kind of went, um, went that route. When we came to the first responders, the state asked that um, because of the small numbers in some departments and some of the um, the question as to how high of a participation level we'd get, um, the state asked us to, amongst ourselves, form um, groups that could, as a group, handle up at least 200 vaccines. Um, we were fortunate that we were able to jump in with some of our partners that we've worked with in the past and become part of a consortium and are slated to get our doses for our first responders that will be actually administered by our first responders. 
um, and that will happen in the coming week. Um, and as we move into the next group, again, we expect the state will be telling us with short notice who will be giving those shots and how they will be rolling out the next groups um, as we continue through phase one and then eventually move over to phase two. The whole situation is extremely fluid. Um, we've already seen that that chart has changed. Um, people who are 75 and older have been um, moved up in the chain into the top of um, phase two. So we do expect that, you know, it's a fluid document as groups are talking to the governor and the commissioner and as they're reviewing data, um, there may be additional changes. Um, but that is the big and exciting news that we have coming up this week. Um, like I, I said, can I ask a question, Kristen, about the um, the vaccine? Mm -hmm. um, I know like when we had the flu clinics back in the old days, um, the Board of Health nurse would give the flu vaccine. Um, are, is, it, is it a consideration that the Board of Health nurse will be giving the vaccines um, after this initial um, vaccination for the first responders? Um, and I'm just wondering what that would look like. like how could they possibly vaccinate, you know, the entire school system? So um, my, again, as I said, we're testing out capacity as we go through these. Um, my understanding is by the time that we finish this round, I believe we will have, Chris, correct me, but I think we're going to have at least close to, if not 20 members of our um department that will be able to administer the vaccine. I think uh, 20 oh, uh, paramedics. Yes, I think about half of us signed up to yeah. um, say we'd administer the vaccine. Yeah, I think it's close to if, if it's not 20. It's very close. It's to right around 20. there. Yeah. So do you do that during like, so you're working and you have people come in during your work hours? What does that look like? Um, I'm gonna let we haven't it hasn't rolled out yet we have a meeting tomorrow night part of our m m rounds and we're going to be going over um the procedure as far as giving a vaccine we give shots in the ambulance all the time so that's not an issue um there's a certain protocol it's not like a typical vaccine the, uh, the moderna uh one which we'll be administering but uh the protocol and logistics are going to be um brought forward to us tomorrow evening so okay. well, I, it's, it's conceivable that you guys will be giving the vaccines to the Eastern Public School um, staff community? If that's what the state and the Department of Public Health decide to do with those doses. As I said, we're going through each band and we're being told we're not making these decisions ourselves other than, so the only decision to be made for the first responders was did we have the capacity and the desire to form into a consortium that would have at least 200 doses allocated to it to be able to get those vaccines into the arms of those first responders in our community that wanted it mm -hmm. or we could have passed the just the only decision to be made was then to say, nope, that's okay, we'll wait for the large scale clinics and just send our people to those, have them drive to Gillette or have them drive out to um, different scenarios. And I, it's going to be, it'll be handed to us in that same format is my expectation for each of these individual tiers. I've heard that there is, um, some of the colleges are actually going to be working in their own consortium type of arrangement where if you're a forward-facing healthcare worker on a college campus, you may have the opportunity to drive to something within an hour to get yours. So each category, it's not assumed that because we're doing the first responders that we would do all other staff. We're taking this very seriously and testing it very seriously because we want to have the capacity. Um, right. as opposed to, you know, needing to do 30 individuals, um, as this a day on this first round, the next step in the after action will be how many that's, we're using one vaccinator that we'll be doing through this first responder piece. 
that can be ramped up to an upper limit of at least the 20 that are entered that have in, expressed an interest in being trained to be able to do this. What we're seeing, um, and we, if we go back to um, H1N1, um, prior to the H1N1, those, that was our only, we had nurses giving vaccines. When H1N1 came and the capacity and the need was that much greater, the state made adjustments and we saw pharmacists being able to give shots. We saw the EMTs, the paramedics. With COVID, they've actually expanded down to medical students who have gone through specific training. Now, the training that Chris mentioned also has to be under the direction of a medical director, an MD who is willing to take this on. Um, the town is extremely fortunate that we have a wonderful partner in the medical director associated with the fire department. And that's why we're able as a team to roll this out. In the past when we had flu, yes, it was the town nurse, but it was a contract nurse under the Visiting Nurse Association. So there was, a, again, a bigger capacity there to actually um, hold, receive, hold, administer um, the vaccine. As we're rolling this out, and this survey went out just before the holidays, we've now had to ramp up and install equipment. We've had to get into registered into the state's brand new that they're just rolling out vaccine tracing software program um, that we're all getting trained in right now. So this is all evolving very quickly and very uniquely to this situation. I have two more questions and they're very biased. Um, I was not part of H1N1. I didn't work in the system then. Um, you mentioned nurses were doing the vaccines. Was this a voluntary thing and done after hours or was this something that there was payment? So it, it was the visiting nurses. Oh, I'm there. sorry. I thought you said nurses. You meant school. We nurses. did have an opportunity during one of the clinics where um, a couple of school nurses did work under the VNA and were compensated. Okay. And then my other question is, um, is we're the first responders most most definitely needed to be vaccinated. Um, any thoughts to the school nurses who work with sick kids is getting vaccinated? And so, you know, you know, in real time. So what we have been told is we need to follow those protocols and those mm -hmm. pieces that are um, laid out by the governor and his commission as to what the next phase is. We can't, we couldn't move, first responders couldn't get their shots till the nursing homes were done. So where the next forward facing individuals go, I believe that school nurses are being included in that healthcare worker at the bottom of phase one. That's what I um, thought, okay. That's what I, I was under the impression that that's where school nurses potentially were being placed. Although it comes up every week on our call because we'd all like to see that actually printed there. We'd all like to see an expansion um, of what those categories, what those are. You know, after um, congregate care, it says shelters, it says some of these other pieces so that we can picture what we're talking about. And I think we'd all like to see um, spelled out a little bit clearer what is in each category. Thank you. And the, the pop-up thing, is that a one day thing? Kristen? That it's a one day thing for now. Okay. Um, we'll see how it goes. We'll see what the demands. Part of it is to assess the demand. Are people okay. having trouble getting tested? Are they, um, you know, we don't, you don't want to schedule too soon because your circumstances could change. And as I've said before, there are a lot of different reasons why people get tested. Um, but this will provide an opportunity. It'll also provide an opportunity for us to test kind of this drive through type of um, processing. Um, Tim and Mark will both be there. We have, uh, you know, different checks, checkpoints. We did a walkthrough today. We're rolling out some new technologies with um, the different laptops and the different other pieces um, that um, would need to all flow. And it will give us a chance to test it. We also feel like it's providing a valuable service to the town. Um, it's providing valuable um, testing op service opportunity and testing opportunity and training opportunity for our first responders. 
Um, so we feel like it's a win-win if it goes well and if we can um, secure funding and depending on what funding is out there, um, you know, it could repeat. That's a lot of news, thank you. Yep. I mean, we had to build everything from the registration system, you know, for ourselves. Um, that, um, thank goodness for, you know, the, the teams that we have in place and the support that we have in other offices um, across the board in town hall, um, that we were able to actually roll out a registration system that we think is going to work for this. Um, whether it would work in a larger application, I don't know. Um, but there are a lot of heads and a lot of work that's being done together to make this thing happen. Anything, anybody? Are we ready to move on to the variances? Yes. Oh, was that it for COVID? That, okay. unless anybody else has any other questions, that's, that's the information that I had to present. There was a question it looked like in the chat. Yeah, I actually was just going to answer that. I guess I could do it live as well. Um, do you know how many positive cases are currently in the schools? That data is posted on the school website as well as the DESE website. So I would refer anybody looking for case counts um, to the DESE website and the Easton Public Schools website. I believe they're both updated once a week with the current numbers for the, um, the preceding period. Uh, I did have one question, Kristen, actually, um, and I don't know if this falls under what you do. As far as town employees, school, municipal side, close contacts, how does that work? Say you're an employee and somebody you live with, you're, 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 you live with your mother-in-law and she ends up being positive. As a close contact, should can, are you allowed to remain in the workplace? Or I, I know that the fire department we, we do things out of an abundance of caution, which is great. But you know everybody besides us, how does that work? So there is an exemption for first responders, um, and we work. One of the criteria for that exemption to be utilized is that there needs to be a definite and defined stress on the department. The first option that we all like to use as much as we possibly can is to just observe the quarantine and remove the person who potentially may develop into a positive case. In situations where that isn't possible, um, there are special precautions that can be taken by essential personnel that allow them to continue to work. And there are policies and procedures that have been laid out by the state as well as I believe the chiefs um, to their departments. Um, as far as if you were not a firefighter police officer in the community, if Tim or Mark, I'll use them as an example, if they were to have a positive in their households, they would be required to quarantine in accordance with the state's prescribed protocols, TDC's protocols. Um, as far as us knowing about it if and being able to some of that tracing we only have access i only have access um in maven to cases that live in easton so if it were a case that were not um in town um you know we would ask that town and we have asked um other towns to share the case with us so that we can update information so that we can see what is being collected by the contact tracer in the town dealing with the positive. Um, that is all we can see. When it's out of town, we actually have to request it. Um, and we have, we've had a number of cases um, where either because of workplace and not just even town workplace, but you know, special situations, long-term care facilities in our town, schools in our town, where we've asked for the case to be shared with us. And that way we can see the notes, we can see the dates, um, we can see the contacts as they're evolving. Uh, Kristen, I have a question. <clears throat> if someone in a household has direct exposure, um, but has not yet received test results, should children stay home from school until we have a definitive negative or positive in the house? 
So if um, I'm, I'm going to kind of go scenario based just to try to make this make a little bit more sense. Um, I'm going to go mom and dad and two kids. Um, dad's positive and he becomes the positive that needs to isolate. The quarantine period for the rest of the family begins when that can happen. Now, for some people, that, that can happen. Some people are able to take that positive person and put them in a master bedroom with an attached bathroom. Some people are able to take that person and put them down in the family room down cellar that has its own bathroom and deliver food to the door and, base, and do exactly as the word says, isolate that positive to potentially stop the spread. If that can happen, the quarantine begins for the rest of the members of the family on the day that that happens. Using the new protocol that's out there, after that's day zero. After day five, on day five or after, the rest of the family members can opt to go get tested. Till those results are back, nobody should be breaking quarantine. Once those results are back and assuming that the positive in the house is staying in their basement or staying up in their own suite somewhere in the house or is gone to stay somewhere else alone, people can exit their quarantine. Unfortunately, what we're seeing happen is when the other members of the family are going for those tests on day five, they're coming back with one or two more positives. And what that means to the people who then just tested negative is they have to restart their quarantine because until they separate from that positive, they've been being exposed. We have no idea when that positive became a positive and we would have to treat everybody as now it's a brand new exposure. So I'm not sure if that specifically answers your question. Um, and it, it is, yes, you have to wait for the test results to come back. Um, if people are having trouble getting information from their providers, um, they, the provider is the best place to try to get the information. Um, hopefully we're seeing improvements with a lot of this as the weeks go by. Um, and we hopefully will continue to see. I'd like to just put out there for anybody that was watching this that the um, Stop the Spread, the Project Beacon group that you can find on the mass.gov website, um, those, they have a lot more availability for tests. They're free, they're non-rapid, and the turnaround time is 24 hours. So a lot of people's first inclination is to go to urgent care um, and that kind of place, which, which is fine. Um, if you don't have the right insurance, you, you will have to pay. Whereas at this other place, you never have to pay. Um, and the turnaround time can be much longer at a, at a, an urgent care kind of facility. So if you're, if it's a, if it's, um, you know, a time sensitive thing, you want to know right away. Um, financially, if you can't absorb the cost, I would really recommend going to that website, um, making an appointment. You may have to travel a little bit farther but you will have you will have faster results and you will not have to pay is that it there's another question in the um in the queue Kristen, you're muted There is um, part of that discrepancy in the numbers has to do with the fact that um, all positives get reported to DESE, but they only require, um, or they only post, I believe, I can't remember if it's whether they've been in school for the last seven days. So if we go back to that scenario that I was just using to answer Aria's question, a lot of times, so now the child may be the third wave in the house to test positive. And they actually started quarantining when the first positive came in. So they haven't been in school. So Desi does make some type of adjustment. And I just off the top of my head, um, don't know exactly what it is, but they don't in some of their counts or they adjust their counts to only have kids that have actually been in school 
within, I believe it's the preceding seven days. But I would refer questions on the specifics of DESE to the superintendent. Um, is the second part to that question still, it looks like. We're always in contact with the, the, um, the schools. Um, we have not, I actually am personally on um, a call at least daily, um, oftentimes Saturday and Sunday included, where we are going through um, any positives that I'm aware of, any positives that they become aware of, um, and we are constantly communicating. Um, right now, we're seeing um, numbers. We are, are we're seeing numbers of cases. Um, we, to date, to my knowledge, do not have anything that links a positive to another positive in the school environment. But yes, we are constantly, um, I'm, on, I'm on at least an hour a day with the superintendent and the assistant superintendent um, going through cases and numbers and very much keeping um, our finger on the pulse of what's happening in every environment. Um, we're routinely on. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, it's fine. We're routinely on, you know, with a lot of our childcare providers, our um, nursery schools. We're, we're spread pretty thin, but we're making time to talk to everybody um, that, that reaches out and that needs our assistance. When just to piggyback on that person's question about schools, because I'm in the school and this has something that I had thought, does that include extracurricular activities um, like sports and stuff, if there's an exposure within a sport? If there's an exposure within a school sport, in the school yeah. environment, then yes, contact tracing is being done. We're discussing what needs to be done. Um, and and is that considered a school exposure? I don't know how, whether DESE would consider that a school exposure. I, I don't know what they're using for their definitions. Could you let us know, like maybe check into that? I'd be sure. interested. Thank you. Kristen, at what point, um, this is my, my own thinking out loud. At, at what point are there parameters where schools say, okay, we have to shut it down, go full remote? Or is that not, I, I understand it's not really like a DESE decision because some schools, some schools are full remote, some aren't. Mm -hmm. are, are there thresholds or parameters? That, that's a question that I get asked quite often actually. At, at what point with number wise, okay, we have to just shut it down and go full remote. Or, you know, we can keep doing things the way they are, hybrid wise or, or what have you. Are, are there parameters in place? There are no set parameters okay. in place um, that I'm aware of that say, as soon as you have 100 cases, because those 100 cases could be completely unrelated. So essentially, the decision then lies upon the superintendent and or the school committee if they feel that it's got too out of control case-wise that they would close. Yes. Okay. I, that's my understanding. I mean, if, if it were getting to a place where I felt um, there needed to be a bigger conversation, I would, of course, raise that flag. Sure. Um, but right now, we are seeing the majority of spread that we are seeing is exactly what the state continues to report. It is small right. social gatherings. Um, it is households. I think a lot of concern and speculating, but the numbers are more than there were in the spring and no one was in school in the spring. And I agree that the holidays, it was, it was a given, we were expecting it, almost preparing for it. Um, but that seems to be, I, I, I'm asking questions that I get asked a lot. That's why no, no hidden agenda or anything like that. Just, um, and I think people would like to know, they don't, it just seems like nobody knows who's calling the shots when it gets to that point. They, they think it lies on this board and we're, you know, we're, we're the board of health, we're not health and human services. And there's a very distinct line between the two. Um, 
And regardless, they think a lot of those decisions come from this group as opposed to, well, the decision whether or not you're going to have school or not lies within the school board and the superintendent, not even Desi. I get asked a lot because I'm a school nurse, I'm on the board of health, what involvement do you, does, does the director and the board have with these decisions? And honestly, I would have to defer to you, Kristen, because I know I don't have any um, involvement with a lot of decisions and I'm not even really, I don't, I don't really know a lot of what the conversation is. So I also get a lot of um, uh, questions about what is, what is your role as the director of the Board of Health for Easton in overseeing that or, or are you supposed to? I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> I guess we can further this conversation, but as I said, I am in conversation daily with the superintendent and the assistant superintendent. I am um, confirming positives. I am um, helping them with contact lists. Um, we are available to anybody who is um, deemed a contact um, and has any questions. The correspondence that goes out from the school includes my email as well as our department e email, boardofhealth at easton.ma.us. I think one of the things that we need to kind of separate is because there are a couple of issues from the question that's being asked. There are um, a lot of athletes that are home right now um, because of exposures in sports circumstances. So they've all been identified as contacts and they're at home. We do have teachers that are absent. We face this even when we go through a bad year with flu where at some point there needs to become a discussion where so many people are out, what does it make sense to do? Historically, when it was flu, those were discussions that would happen between the superintendent with some guidance from the Board of Health. If we want to start looking at this um, through a broader lens and start having some broader conversations, we can work towards that goal as well. Um, I, I mean, I just, I, right now, as I said, I am on a Zoom at least daily reviewing cases. And to date, I have not seen the, the magnitude of the, multi, the majority of our cases in Easton, the spread is happening at small social gatherings and it is happening in households. So from what you're saying is that it, it doesn't, it's less, and I could be wrong, it's less important the number of kids that are out because of exposures or, or being COVID. It's if it happened in school. That would be a very different scenario in my mind. Right now, there are, um, there are a lot of, um, precautions in place. We're in hybrid. We have 50% of our student population, give or take, because we do have some children who are there four days a week. And we do have some special circumstances. We do have kids who have chosen to be full remote, families that have decided that um, for their family, having their kids at school is not the choice that they want to make at this time. We have, because of those um, lack of, pre the, the, because of the relief of those numbers, we're able to maintain a six foot separation. We're able to keep everybody masked. Everybody is doing everything that is being asked of them and it shows. We have not to date that we are aware of had any person to person spread within the schools. If that changes, you know, that would be, um, you know, a scenario, again, I'm, we're in conversation daily. The first hint that that is changing, there would be cause for bigger discussions. And by in school, you mean brick and mortar school, being in the school, not school activities, but brick and mortar school. 
I would say any for us, for our discussion purposes, whether or not, as you've asked me to look into whether or not DESE considers sports banned to actually be in school, I think we're all intelligent, practical people that if we were seeing it actually spread, that situation would need to be looked at in the environment, be it a classroom, be it a locker room, be it a practice room. Um, there's another attendee who's asking, there's no specific info for each school. This leads to nervousness for families. Um, there is a lot of discussion um, at the state level. Um, again, this is probably a question better posed to the superintendent or the school committee uh, because that is their posting and their, you know, protocol that they're putting up there. Um, but there is a lot of um, um, pressure from the state, or, or not, I don't want to say pressure, but there's been a lot of advice from the state to not break it out into small enough pieces that somebody would be easily identifiable. Um, this is something that is somebody's medical history um, and not everybody is comfortable sharing that. So um, that I think is one of the factors that may come into play, but I would refer this question over to um, the superintendent or the school committee. Okay, um, anybody have anything else? Nope. Go ahead. I know no, you want to. Go uh, ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to point out we only have this room until six o'clock. So um, if the board wants, we can schedule a meeting. I mean, we were going with every other week. If you want to come back next week um, and go over some of these things and, you know, switch to that mode where we're in a surge, we can make that happen. That might be a good idea because we'll have some feedback on how the inoculations and drive through went as well. Okay. okay. Which the public Monday, might, you know, be interested in. Does next Monday work for everyone? Um, yes. Yeah, so is there any? Oh, it's a holiday. It is oh, a holiday. It is. So Tuesday? Works for me. We'll all be working. Okay. Tim and Mark will be working a clinic and I'll be there with them. So will you be able to have the meeting then? Yes or no? On Tuesday? Yeah. Yep, we'll just make sure that there's a meeting room available. I doubt that there'll be a problem, but we'll follow up. I'll have Nicole follow up with an email. Great. Thank you for um, all, all those thoughtful answers. Can we move on to variances or? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first um, variance we have is 105 Washington Street, a variance to change an existing office space from a chiropractic care office to a permanent makeup office. Okay, um, so something we have here uh, is a, an existing building, 105 Washington Street. It's been a chiropractic office since I was a little kid and delivered newspapers there. Um, they still, the, the chiropractor still owns the building. It's an older septic system. And if I were to figure out the gallons per day in the septic system, which is around 450 gallons per day, and the amount of rooms he had in there, it, it, the the math doesn't work out, even though he's been in there forever because the doctor's office is um, two, 225 gallons a day per doctor and um, a tattoo, permanent makeup is a form of tattoo um, is the way we look at it for septic flow um, is around 100 gallons per day. So what we, the uh, owner of the business, uh, not owner of the business, the owner of the uh, of the building was looking to do is get an approval um, to not switch out their septic system. And I did some numbers from uh, the other tattoo shop in town, which also has an apartment above it. So they're very similar because this has an apartment with it as well. And um, their gallons per day, they're using around 110 with the business with four, four tattoo rooms and a one bedroom apartment. So uh, I, I believe it's very reasonable to do such. I just, it's uh, to the, pur the purview of the board to uh, approve this because it, it would be a variance. Any questions? Make a motion to approve then. Does anybody want to make a motion? I have no questions. Uh, I'll make a uh, motion to approve the variance for 105 Washington Street, a variance to change an existing office space from a chiropractic care office to a permanent makeup office. Second. 
All those in favor? Uh, Zayas, yes. Mills, yes. LeBlanc, yes. And oops, I just lost it. Bear with me. Sorry. Nine whole that way? Yes. Could somebody, I just lost that uh, page. If somebody could just read that off. Oh, I got it. Nine Hobart Way. Grant a variance from the requirement that a leaching area be placed at a minimum of 100 feet from a well. <clears throat> okay, so what we have is a situation here um, where there's an existing potable drinking water well on the property and because of conservation restrictions, um, the home and the septic system have to be in a certain area from the well. And the distance from the well would be 59 feet, which is allowable by Title V, but, but not by our local regulation. So they're looking to ask for a variance to go from 100 feet to 59 feet to the um, septic field. And this is a new house being built to the septic field and um, the actual uh, reserve area would be further away than 59 feet. So that's what they're looking for. Um, I did notify to have the engineer of record here tonight, but I, I don't, I looked through and I did not see it, it would be Frank Gallagher. So um, it's up to the board um, if they want to approve this or to table it to the next meeting. Do you have any make sure that oh, the engineer is here. Good, Chris. Fra you Frank talking? is there. I he's think one he's of here. The oh, he is? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. I can't, I, I couldn't get on on my tablet, so I'm on my oh, phone Frank. right now. Okay. Is he on? He just looks like he left. Oh, oh, there he comes. He's coming up. Now he's a panelist. Oh. He's muted. Yeah, he's muted. Hello. Hi, Hi Frank. Yep, go ahead. Uh, I just pretty much read what, what's going on. Oh, okay. All right. Five, Boy. five Hobart Way. Um, yes. As you know, Eastern requires the engineer that stamps the plan to be present at the meeting. So we're waiting for you. Um, so if the, the board has any questions for Frank, uh, please feel free to ask. I don't have any questions for Frank, but maybe this will be for either you, uh, Kristen, or Tim. This is not an uncommon request to, to, to cheat it down below 100 feet, correct? Yeah, Title V would allow you to go to 50 feet for a drinking well. Yeah. Um, we it, it does it does if it's if you have the room to do 100, we'd like to see the 100. Sure. And in new construction, you're usually able to make it, but the conservation restriction around the property doesn't allow it us to put the septic system anywhere. No, the engineer, not us, the engineer to put it anywhere right. else on the property right. and to oh, fit the house in there as well. It's a tough so. spot. No, I'm I'm willing to make a motion to uh, approve the variance for that. Why why are Easton's regulations more stringent than state regulations? They're not. Uh, Title five for drinking water well wants a hundred feet, but you can. Oh, okay. But ours, we have other stuff in our regulations that as more stringent that are more stringent. Certain levels of testing are a little more stringent. Um, we also added in the like geothermal wells and stuff that weren't that aren't in Title Five so much. So um, they, they, it's something that when I have some time, I'm going to review and maybe make some edits so it mirrors Title Five a little more closely. So won't be for a while that you'll have that time, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Hobart Way, that's that's off at North Main, right? Correct. Yeah, it's that 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 parcel which is behind the Queen. Yeah, and and. We have a tough conservation group, so it, it's they're strict. So I can I can see the issues with that because there's, there's a the quiz that runs right through there and everything. But um, I'm comfortable with it. I'd make a motion to approve. Seconded. All those in favor? Zayas, yes. Mills, yes. LeBlanc, yes. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. All right, bye now. So it's um, 5.50. Is there anything else anybody wants to bring up? Are we good? Any, any inspection issues? I don't know, anything? 
that was easy. Um, Tim, if you have anything to add, I know you, you, you've fielded a lot of stuff. Um, no, just um, a lot of phone calls. That's really about it. Tell me about it. <laughs> All right, so we're good. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting January 11th um, at 5.50 p.m. So moved. Second. Seconded. All those in favor? Zayas, yes. Mills, yes. LeBlanc, yes. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate the time. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Good night. Bye.